Hi everyone, my name is Nikhil Mike. I am a research associate at the University of Bristol. Today I'll be presenting a systematic literature review titled uh, From Solter and Schroeder to 2021. This was a paper from a, a while back, but you know, uh, that's why it says 2021. Um, so it's uh, 47 years of research on the, the development and validation of security API recommendations, a paper that I've written with Andrew Dwyer, Joseph Hallett, and Oase Rashid. Um, okay, let's start. So um, we'll start off by understanding the problem. So the developers, they find security APIs very difficult to use. Um, uh, an, an empirical study by Agil found that 88% of um, just over 11,000 um, applications from the Google Play Store um, had at least one of six common cryptographic mistakes. An example of one of these mistakes would be uh, to use um, ECB, uh, that's the electronic codebook, uh, the block cipher, instead of uh, CBC, for example. Um, Martin Georgiev uh, wrote the most dangerous code in, in the world. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at his, his, his work later, but he, one of the, the conclusions he came up with was that the root cause of many of these vulnerabilities can be uh, due to the badly designed uh, cryptographic APIs and um, SSL implementations. Um, ACA uh, had this study called Comparing the Usability of Cryptographic APIs, where she compared five Python based uh, cryptographic APIs and um, asked, um, I think it was 256 Python the developers to perform a number of common cryptographic tasks. And she found like um, factors such as API complexity and the poor documentation uh, serve as the common barriers uh, when using these cryptographic APIs. Uh, so in response, the uh, usable security research the community um, has taken three the general uh, approaches to try and solve this type of problem. Uh, the first being the, the, the design of more usable cryptographic APIs such as Cryptlib, NACL, and its more recent fork, Libsodium. We have security tools such as CryptoLint. This was used by Agel to analyze the uh, 11,000 plus uh, Android applications to see you know, which one of them made these common cryptographic mistakes. You have uh, the Cognicrypt as well. Um, so this is an, uh, an application that has two primary features. The first being a code generation feature where for um, six common cryptographic tasks, it outputs a block of code that um, the idea is to seamlessly integrate with the, the, the developer's workspace. The second feature being a static analysis um, part of, uh, of the tool that basically um, highlights um, where you're using weaker cryptographic um, algorithms. Uh, we will be looking at recommendations in this, in this study, which is the, the third approach. So what did we do? <clears throat> we started off with 13 the papers that offered um, recommendations for improving um, the usability of security APIs through the design. And we traced the ancestry of the recommendations found in each of these papers um, in the sense that like how were they influenced and how did they come to be. And um, as a result, we came up with a total of 65 papers offering a total of 883 recommendations over the span of 47 years. So like every time we found a paper, we would see how were their recommendations influenced and so on until we found like the original uh, set of papers uh, that were very old. Um, we categorize these papers into security API designer, API designer, software engineering, and security engineer. So security API, Security API, the designer literature, focuses uh, on providing recommendations to improve um, the usability of security APIs through the design. API designers uh, 
That type of literature focuses on improving API design in general. Software engineering focuses on um, offering recommendations for software in general uh, and security engineering. It's not specific. It's not. Um, it, it it's not specific to APIs. It's uh, security applications in general. You know, that type of literature. So when it comes to the 883 recommendations that we, we found from all this literature, we categorize that further um, into seven different categories. And with, like the seven also had 36 uh, subcategories as well. Um, so when it comes to assessment, uh, these types of recommendations uh, encourage uh, the quality engineering, the quality assessment, um, Construction. So this focuses on um, the 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 code itself, the technical aspects of um, you know uh, the development process, um, introducing abstraction into the the, the design of um, security APIs, for example. Uh, default secure. So here we're looking at bug management, um, uh, allowing for uh, the default um, secure options when it comes to choosing the parameters, certain functions, security functions. Documentation, of course, this is uh, recommendations that um, basically talk about offering uh, examples of code, documentation, number of different resources to help the, the developer use the APIs better. Organizational factors, um, so this is uh, recommendations uh, primarily for organizations uh, and they focus on instant handling, uh, the developer training um, and um, the, the choosing of third parties for example um, have requirements so the act of uh, writing and reading requirements and understanding um, the, the these are recommendations that you know uh, talk about um, that that focus on trying to improve the understanding of, of APIs and code readability. Uh, what do current recommendations focus on? Well, we found um, that security API the designer, API designer, and software engineering recommendations um, put, uh, put a lot of focus into the construction and understanding um, the categories. So, we can see that Security API Designer, 36% um, of their total recommendations focus on construction, followed by 24% uh, towards understanding. Uh, this is uh, scaled a bit more when we look at API designer recommendations. So 57% focus on construction and 21 on understanding. Uh, this uh, relationship is reversed a little uh, when we look at um, software engineering recommendations, so we have 25% uh, going towards construction of code um, and 54% of the recommendations focusing on the understanding. Um, security engineering recommendations, they focus primarily on assessment and requirements uh, with 25% and 18% of the um, recommendations going towards that. Yeah, uh, organizational factors. So how do organizations and um, its developers uh, follow best practices, uh, legal requirements and instant handling processes for software defects? So we found that most of this literature, uh, the corporate literature and the academic literature had a connection um, made by two primary papers, uh, Tondal and Asal. Um, say one more minute, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, yeah, we did have quite a bit to cover. Um, basically, um, when it comes to whether we're validating recommendations, uh, in the paper we come up with a number of uh, different types of relationships that you can see between the papers. So this is the, the extent to which the recommendations have been validated. So uh, we'll go through that in the paper. There's basically four different types, and you have empirical validation as well. We talk about the uh, importance of, of empirical validation um, and you know the, the purpose being to test the effectiveness for recommendations suggested by papers. Uh, that being said, we find that 
Overall, 22% of the papers engage in empirical uh, validation, and only three out of the 13 security API designer papers are empirically validated. Uh, yeah, leave it there. How do I get out of this? Yeah. Thank you. I can start by, uh, uh, by asking you, like, how many of uh, these uh, the, the systems out there? Uh, uh, we know, you know, there have been like, you know, serious uh, security vulnerabilities you know, uh, exposed. How many of them are seem to be aware or are following some of these recommendations? Yeah. Well, yeah, we looked into the corporate literature, and um, most of them focused on. Um, these, these organizational factors, you know, talking about instant handling, uh, but they didn't focus that much on the other types of um, recommendations that, that we found, such as assessment, um, documentation was, 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 was one of them, uh, and the, the, the construction of code. So it's quite a few different um, areas that can be improved you know, in, in corporate literature. Okay. Yeah. Yep. What, what would be your top recommendations uh, to industry to improve? Yeah, well, um, there's a number of um, different types of papers that have been very influential um, over time. And uh, also, um, uh, like, like, for example, the, the Solskjaer and Schroeder paper, uh, they, they offered a number of um, uh, recommendations for improving the security of uh, the protection mechanisms. Um, now, we saw the evolution of those recommendations happen over time um, through cryptographic libraries, but also they were empirically validated as well. Um, but what was interesting was we saw them, those recommendations from 1974 uh, be directly, um, what do you call it, um, um, adapted by more recent works in 2020, for example. So. The, the, the finding we basically came up with was to revisit these types of older papers and um, you know, uh, look into what types of recommendations they had to offer. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. For thank you. Me. So, hello again. My name is Victoria Kaczynski and I am from the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. Uh, today I will be presenting our work on the on-demand security requirement synthesis with relational generative adversarial networks. Before I go more into detail about that though, I would like to give a short overview about why we focus specifically on generating security requirements. Requirements engineering involves the identification, analysis, documentation of necessary attributes, characteristics, and qualities, as well as features of a software system. As a result, requirement specifications tend to focus specifically on functional needs of stakeholders, therefore often ignoring important security aspects. Additionally, requirements engineers are not security experts usually, and as a result, security requirements are often created independently of other requirements. Security requirements analysis tools, as well as creation tools, tend to often be manual in nature. Therefore, our goal is to automate the process of developing and generating contextualized security requirements that are effective, complete, clear, and consistent, and we aim to do this using a generative adversarial network machine learning model. So what is a GAN? A GAN is an adversarial machine learning model where we have a generator and a discriminator that compete against each other. The generator model creates synthetic samples of data by capturing data distribution from input samples. On the other hand, the discriminator determines whether each sample is real or synthetic. Both the generator and discriminator improve until the synthetic data is indistinguishable from real data. GANs have traditionally been used on image data but recently they have shown a lot more promise on sequential, discrete, and text-based data. 
We aim to investigate the practicality of GANs in the requirements engineering domain, and we focus on a model called WellGAN, which has shown a lot of promise in the generation of textual data, especially for longer sentences. Specifically, we investigate whether WellGAN can be promising for generating security requirements, whether the proposed method results in high quality security requirements specifications, whether the synthesized security requirements are useful in practice, as well as whether the adjustment of input requirements based on the rules of writing requirements would impact the quality of the synthesized requirements. We decided to conduct a case study based on real-world data in order to demonstrate the practical significance of our approach on the real system. Specifically, we used the requirements document of the Court Case Management System, or CCMS, for the Indiana Supreme Court. This document contains real-world requirements, uh, and it contains both functional and non-functional requirements that are categorized into various subcategories, including security requirements. We have a two-stage study set up, with first getting quantitative metrics, which measure the performance of our approach in terms of standard GAN evaluation metrics, and then we conduct a qualitative analysis, which obtains a deeper understanding of the requirement's usefulness, practicality, and quality. Uh, hopefully this is to confirm our quantitative findings. The data that we use simulates a scenario in which a requirements engineer has functional requirements for the Indiana CCMS, but not security requirements. As a result, we use functional requirements from three different systems, as shown in the table, and we use security requirements from seven different sources, and this again excludes the this excludes those um, CCMS requirements in order to simulate that scenario in which the requirements engineer does not have security requirements for that system. Our data is split into an 80-20 split for training and testing, where the testing data is used to obtain blue score metrics for GAN quality measurements, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the upcoming slides. Our pre-processing consists of basic pre-processing tasks uh, that ensure that sentence length and structure are fairly consistent. These tasks focus on removal of wordy phrases, separating requirements that might have multiple sentences or multiple bullet points into multiple requirements, as well as ensuring correct pronunciation or punctuation. Sorry. We utilize RELGAN, a GAN model that has been built on combining the power of a relational memory-based generator with multiple embedded representations provided by the convolutional neural network-based discriminator. Our generator has two phases. First, in the pre-training phase, the generator model is trained on real requirement samples using maximum likely hood estimation. Then, during the adversarial training phase, the pre-trained generator model is transferred to the generator discriminator adversarial model in order to provide a better initialization than random noise. Our discriminator, on the other hand, only works in the adversarial training phase, where it is based on uh, samples that are both real and synthetic. The discriminator provides probabilities of whether each incoming sample is real data or synthetic data. Now I'd like to talk about some results. We look into whether RELGAN is promising for generating security requirements by measuring some GAN quality metrics. For sample diversity, we use negative log likelihood. A high negative log likelihood score is an indicator of mode collapse, which is a condition in which the generator over-optimizes and results in the synthesized samples being identical to each other or having a lot of repeated character sequences. For sample quality, we use the, what is known as the blue score. The blue score utilizes n-grams, which are sequences of n consecutive words. It compares the n-grams of a generated candidate sentence with n-grams of a set of reference sentences, in this case, that would be our test data. Using n-grams as opposed to single words helps differentiate realistic sentences from sentences that have realistic words and in a random order. Blue scoring also uses a brevity penalty to help ensure that generated sentences are of a realistic length. You can see in the table that our sample diversity and quality scores are close to those obtained by Relgan in another text generation domain of generating image captions. 
Next, we investigate whether the proposed method results in high quality security requirement specifications. And we do this by conducting a human subject evaluation with nine subject matter experts. We found that the most common defects are ambiguous and incomplete sentences, and that's because oftentimes these categories encompass other categories. Our least common defects, implicit subjects, multiple sentences, and weak phrases um, might be the least common and because the underlying structure of security requirements discourages the use of these types of defects. Grammatically correct requirements have much less defects, with 82.9% of them being defect free. Here, we investigate whether these synthesized requirements are useful in practice. Our usefulness was evaluated by our nine subject matter experts on the Likert scale, with five being a requirement that's extremely useful for the Indiana CCMS, and one being a requirement that's not at all useful. On average, on average the usefulness of all requirements was just under four, and the average usefulness of medically correct requirements ended up being around or a little bit over four. In this experiment, we mapped original CCMS security requirements to equivalent generated requirements. I'd like to once again note that these original requirements on the left are not included in the training data. We want to simulate that scenario in which they don't exist in the first place to show that Relgam can generate realistic requirements. Overall, around 26 to 29% of the original CCMS requirements were generated by Relgam. Finally, we investigated whether the adjustment of input requirements based on rules of writing requirements impact the quality of synthesized requirements. Here we conducted another round of processing based on the guidelines for writing the requirements, and this included replacing the phrases, removing subjective phrases, and removing implicit subjects. We actually found no improvements in the generated requirements, and in fact, found some increase in ambiguity. This could be because the pre-processed requirements potentially were a little more complex or maybe less consistent. This also shows that more research is still needed to determine how different types of pre-processing might affect the synthesized requirements. I'd like to end with three key takeaways of this work. First, GANs and RELGAN specifically have shown to be promising for synthesizing useful security requirements. While our study focuses on the judicial domain, we also have generated some requirements for other domains, suggesting that with the right info requirements, this use of GATS might be generalized to other domains. Second, we found that GATS support creativity in requirements engineering, with some generated requirements having a usefulness of 4 to 5, but not being mapped to an original CCMS security requirement. Finally, we found that some of our generated security requirements were underspecified in terms of missing details, thus highlighting the need for continued research in this area. That is all that I have for you for today, and thank you for attending my presentations. I am now uh, ready for questions. So, um, hello, what did those requirements actually look like? So some of the text was too small to read from the back here. So maybe maybe this is the reason why I'm asking this question, not sure about this. So you can have very generic requirements that says contents of a case shall not be read by people not involved in the case, which is fairly high level. Or you can say this uh, field must not be read by anyone who does not have a security clearance for secret given that he is not a member of the, you, you get what I mean. Um, so you can have very high level or very low level uh, requirements. So is this particular useful for one of them or did you always get one and not the other or what did you essentially get out? So because we gave the uh, RELGAN a bunch of different types of requirements as it in its input data, we ended up generating some more gener general requirements as well as some more specific requirements. Uh, in this, in this um, table, for example, you can see on the right, the second one is very short and very simple. The system shall log security uh, events. Some of them do end up having a little more detail, uh, such as the first one or maybe uh, saying that the system shall provide the capability to automatically tailor the content presented to every user based on their security profile. Um, but again, the GAN did, the GAN did generate um, a mix. We did find that some requirements were uh, 
some will underspecify, they were a little more general. Uh, however, we plan to continue to uh, fine-tune the inputs in order to help uh, again generate more detailed and specific requirements. So it was a mix, uh, but we do still want to improve that as well. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? So as a quick question, I'm, I'm curious, did you, uh, uh, did, has the system also generated contradictory requirements? Requirements that contradicted each other? Yes. Uh, we did not find any requirements that contradicted each other as far as I remember. Uh, it was more of the case where we found requirements that um, Make some requirements that may not have um, been very relevant, or, or maybe they mm -hmm. weren't grammatically correct, maybe they had some of those defects. Um, but as far as I have seen, I, I did not see any um, contradictory requirements. Any other questions? And I guess overall, because I mean, I'm curious, do you, do you see this as a mostly positive or a mostly negative result? I mean, I guess there are. Uh, um, mixed conclusions in some way? Are you, are you trying to, uh, do you think that's something promising to, uh, to try to explore further based on the, the current experience? Yes, yeah, so I do think that um, GANs are definitely uh, something that is showing promise in the generation of requirements. And we specifically looked at security requirements. So of course there's a lot more um, to look into like different types of requirements, functional, non-functional requirements, requirements in different domains, and so on. Uh, of course, uh, it is we did want to do that on a real-world system, and therefore uh, the requirements that we had input uh, there's there's a limit to the amount of requirements and data that we were able to obtain. Uh, but I do believe that if we were to uh, find more requirements data and continue uh, investigating into this, we can definitely uh, see promise in, in, this, in this method. All right. Thank you very much. Let's uh, thank once again. Uh, I think we are out of time. I'm studying for a doctorate at UCC in Cork in Ireland, funded by Science Foundation Ireland via the Advanced Programme. And I'm here to talk about a paper I wrote with Uts Rudig and Klaas Jan Stahl called Measuring Secure Coding Practice and Culture. A finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. What do I point it at, this? Or this? <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Uh, students, psychological reports and abuse allegations leaked by ransomware hackers. We all know that insecure software development leads to vulnerabilities in software. This facilitates crime, cybercrime like ransomware. And here's one of the many recent headlines on ransomware crimes. As society increasingly moves online, the chances of the theft and exposure of our private data are constantly rising, not to mention other crimes like stolen credit card data and espionage. The software security community is concerned, and rightly so. <laughs> As scientists, we know that the first step to improving something is measuring it. But how do we measure secure software? One approach is to look at things like BSIM, which Nicol mentioned earlier, and you can see here. It's a list of common software security activities that organizations can use to see if they're doing what everyone else is doing. It's a pretty long list, and researchers usually choose a few items from it, and they often merge those with items from OWASP's SAM, which is a similar methodology that has an equally large number of activities that are not quite the same, and also with things like uh, the safe code list of activities. And they come up with a shortish merged list. The trouble with this approach is it's rather ad hoc. Researchers all come up with their own mix and match items, so you can't compare studies. The truth is software security, like giraffes, is hard to measure. When devising a software security questionnaire, we wanted to be able to quickly compare different organizations. We wanted something empirically based that could be reused by others. We derived an approach from a paper on the BSIM activities. We are at all established that there are 12 BSIM activities that are performed much more frequently than the other 110 or so, 
and tend to be adopted first by organisations. We added questions on each of these 12 common activities to our survey. We also added some other questions, which I'll discuss later. They are activities around penetration testing, code and security reviews, quality assurance, operations feedback, and security processes, like ensuring network security basics are in place and enabling rapid response. We add use of the 12 security activities together to give a simple number from zero to 12 that we call the CA score. This is a lightweight security measurement, but it has a firm empirical foundation. We ran our survey with software developers, including the 12 questions about the use of the common activities in their coding environments. And we obtained 1,100 responses by publicizing the survey on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and elsewhere. On this slide, you can see the number of the common activities undertaken by the 962 valid survey participants. The CA score is on the x-axis. It's a normal bell-shaped distribution and tells us that there was a wide range of security stances amongst our participants' working environments. Numbers for all 12 activities can be seen in the conference paper. Here we show the three most frequently cited activities. The most frequent activity was bugs found in operations monitoring are fed back to development and may change developer behaviour which 77.5% of our respondents said they had present in their environment. The second was, oh, sorry. <laughs> the second was defects found in operations are entered into established defect management systems and tracked through the fixed process at 67.8%. And the third was host and network security basics are in place across any data centers and networks and remain in place during new releases at 65.8%. External checks are a finger, not the moon problem, but a useful diagnostic. This was an observation from one of our survey participants. On looking up finger, not the moon, I discovered that this is a reference to a Buddhist analogy. A finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. It is very relevant to attempts to measure software security. When wading through the detail of determining which practices are undertaken, we may forget that this doesn't actually tell us whether the software is secure. Throughout our activities, we must remember that we are trying to measure something elusive and retain a useful scepticism while we do so. What about the checkbox attitude to security? This is a phenomenon mentioned in numerous studies where security activities are undertaken for compliance reasons with little attention paid to actual security. Could this be present? A study by Haney et al explored organizations that code cryptography and are highly security aware and found that they had a good security culture with mentorship training and time devoted to secure coding practice. But what happens when a secure co security culture is absent? A quote from one of our participants encapsulates some of the consequences. A lot of the questions about bugs or security issues being tracked are kind of missing the point. The system exists, but oftentimes fails. Bugs and bug fixes are in the correct system, but there is not enough time allocated for reporters to verify or validate fixes or for regression. Based on a thorough literature review, we added 12 security culture questions to the survey, and they asked about things like support in the work environment, introduction and use of security tools, views on security culture, software security priority, team communications on software security, and time spent on software security. Answers to all of the security questions can be seen in the accompanying paper. And here we will focus on three of the key questions. So this graph is, uh, shows you, um, for our three key, key questions, we illustrated the correlation with the CA score, which is on the y-axis. So on the y-axis there of that graph, you can see the value between 0 and 12, which represents the number of the common activities that are undertaken by the, uh, by the people in, involved. And at the very top, you can see that uh, there were 12 common activities undertaken. And here we see the correlated answers to the question, how highly do you think your team prioritizes software security? And the answers correlate with the CA score and are very positive at high CA scores. In other words, in organisations where people are saying we're doing all 12 common activities, they are also saying that their team prioritises software security pretty highly. And as you can see, down at the bottom, where people are undertaking none of them, they, uh, they don't think that at all. If we didn't explore any further, we would be happy that for organisations that conduct a high number of the common activities, a security culture is in place. 
Here we see the correlated responses to the question, how often is software security mentioned in team communications? Studies such as Haney et al. lead us to believe that we should see frequent, daily, and certainly weekly discussion of security in a security-aware environment. Yet 18% of our participants in the top CA score said that they discussed security about once a month or less frequently. Another 18% only mentioned it a few times a month, while 64% discussed it once a week or more, as we would expect. Could the 36% cohort, the two 18%, be working in environments with a poor security culture? The most telling question was, roughly how much time do you spend on software security in an average week? As you can see, even in the top cohort, 59% of respondents said less than two hours, with a third of those at less than half an hour, or no time at all. In an organisation with a checkbox attitude to security, undertaking security tasks only in order to tick the compliance checkbox, this is exactly what we would expect to see. All the checkbox items are in place, but with little time devoted to security-specific tasks. This slide reminds us that the contrast between respondents' perception of how their team prioritises security, which we looked at earlier, and the information they gave on practical security tasks is stark. The 12 software security practice a culture questions provide a means to probe the true security stance of an organisation, which is essential if researchers wish to understand the supports available to and the pressures on the developers they are studying. We thank uh, the organisers and our funders, SFI and Advanced CRT. Further information is available in the accompanying paper. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. So maybe I, I, I missed that, but how many organizations and what types of organizations were involved in your uh, survey? So we had uh, 1,100 respondents, and of those, 962 were valid respondents. Uh, so they would have been from, we don't know if any of them were from the same organization because it was an anonymous survey, uh, but, uh, and they spanned a whole range of organizations in different industries. Some of them were freelance developers, some of them were open source developers, there was a huge range. Uh, Laurie? Yeah, so, a couple things. One is like the takeaway. Like, so, yeah. What is the takeaway and the checkbox culture? That's something you're inferring, right? Mm hmm. Uh, well, the checkbox security culture is not sort of something I made up out of my head. You can see it referred to in a lot of different uh, I know, research from papers. Your data, from your but, data. but from my data, I'm inferring it in a case where I see that there's a lot of, of uh, security activities uh, which if one were to only measure security activities, one would then say this is a security aware organization. But what I'm saying, uh, and you know, which say the security climate people would also say, we need to probe a little deeper and we need to look at other aspects of the environment to see if even if those things are there, are they being used? Are they being embraced? Does the organization genuinely care about software security? And that can make a big difference. So for example, there's a couple of papers, um, I think I wrote these down, uh, one of the things that I most, I personally, particularly as an ex-developer, most think is important is having enough time to do what you want. And in a paper called You Get What You're Looking For by ACAR in 2016, 16.7% of the people in the study commented that the tight time limit made it difficult to consider security. And uh, in Fulton in 2022, they, uh, understanding the how and the why, vulnerability could have been, uh, vulner uh, vulnerabilities appeared in the final um, it was a build it, break it, fix it uh, study. And in the final um, um, code that everyone released, there were vulnerabilities that could have been fixed by adding a single line of code. And, they were, and the researchers thought they weren't because there was a short time window. So uh, I think that uh, missing the security culture, you can have the process in place, but, but you're effectively not really coding secure software and you're leaving yourself open to, um, to releasing insecure uh, software. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Was there another question here or uh, it was answered? All right. Uh, Hi. This one in the back. Hi. So, um, I'm, uh, I'm a bit playing devil's advocate here. I would like to challenge a few of the very core concepts of the study. Mm -hmm. So, firstly, those 12 uh, common um, con or things you can do, uh, common actions. Mm -hmm. What if you're doing something that is not on the list, but doing so not doing something that is on the list? So, you replace an item with something that makes much more sense for your specific company. In that case, you might have less points even though you're doing something more intelligent. This is point, point, that I, point one that I would like to challenge. Mm -hmm. Point two is, um, 
I don't think that spending more time on security equals greater security. Assume you have a crappy architecture inside your legacy software and you're security aware and you're trying to do something really simple and it takes you forever. Versus you have a modern software architecture that was built for security and it's actually fairly easy to add, let's say, another endpoint to a web application where you just have to put the correct annotation saying I require administrator access for this endpoint to be called. This is a thing of less than a minute to write that Java annotation and you're pretty much good on access control. So you spend almost no time, you talk to nobody, but you build a secure application. The other guy who spent a day just had crap to work on. <laughs> That's, they're both ex excellent points, thank you very much. Um, I guess for your first point, um, there are uh, 122 activities in the vSIM, and there are probably other activities that organizations that the vSIM people have not encountered also undertake. And you can't ask about all 122 activities. Uh, what you can do is you can say, we know that the, we know it's empirically established that these are the 12 activities that tend to be adopted first and most often by secure, uh, security aware organizations. So let's ask about those. I'm not saying it's a, a definitive measurement that, and you can't go any further. So for example, in our own survey, we had a lot of open-ended questions where people could give us more information. Uh, so that's how I would approach that problem. So I would be, uh, when, I'm, when I'm reviewing individual organizations in my survey, I would be looking at, uh, yes, are people doing more of other things as well? Uh, and a lot of people did come back to me uh, on, um, the issue of time. I think, with, I think that the time issue, again, it's not, uh, it's, it won't, it's not an, um, doesn't, it won't fit for everybody, but it's a really good indicator, I think. And uh, I personally, I mean, I can see that you're, you're shaking your head there and you totally disagree with me. But uh, um, while there may be situations where, uh, where, yes, you have this incredible setup that's very, very security aware and you're using the right frameworks and so on and so forth, I think that for organizations where security is taken seriously, you will still spend time on security because you'll be talking about things like requirements, you'll be doing things like threat modeling. So there will be time spent on it regardless. So if you're saying that you're spending less than half an hour a week on security, I would, I would still think that that would be a matter for concern. Yes, and that's why we have 12 different security culture questions. Unfortunately, it's a little bit simplistic here because we don't have time to go into all of them. But if you read the paper, you'll see that there are 12 different ones. So you can, um, you can get a better genuine feel for the security culture of the organization by looking at the answers to all of them. So do you feel supported to code securely? Another would be, do you agree that there's a good security, code, a security culture in your organization? And I would expect that people who are in compliance where organizations might, um, or compliance focused organizations might disagree with that. We didn't turn them into a single simple measurement as we did with the CA score because this is, is still quite an early stage in this work, in this type of work. And uh, I don't think you can measure security culture with a number from zero to 12. I think what you need to do is use a lot of different probing questions and get a sense of it from there. All right, thanks. Uh, let's uh, thank the speaker once again. Hello everyone, I'm Shinti Kumar Boshak from North Carolina State University. Today, um, I'll be presenting our work, what challenges do developers face about checked in secrets in software artifacts. Our work has been funded by US National Science Foundation, NSF. So let, uh, at first, let us understand what we mean by software secrets. Software secrets are the API keys, tokens, database credentials, username and passwords. And these secrets are uh, used to perform authentication among uh, uh, in external web service integrations such as for payment systems, location services. Um, however, while sharing the secrets with other developers or um, distributing with application packages, developers hard code these secrets inside the source code. For example, in the screenshot, you can see that developer has, has hard coded an AWS access key and secret, uh, secret key uh, in the source code, thus allowing the attackers to gain access using that AWS sec secret key. On March 2023, GitGuardian has stated that the, uh, over 10 million secrets have been detected in 2022, um, which is a 67% increase from the previous year, 2021. And out of uh, 10 authors, one author uh, exposed at least one secret in the version control system. Even the big companies are also part of, uh, becoming part of the secret sprawl each year. So Toyota accidentally exposed a secret thus allowing the uh, attackers to gain access of their customer data. 
Uber has been breached for uh, hardcore sectors present in their partial scripts. The attacker gained access, um, uh, the administrator access using the hardcore secrets, and they uh, gained the access internal uh, internally used tools uh, at Uber. And this has not been the first time Uber has been breached. They have been breached previously in 2014 and 16 as well. So as you can see that the secret leakage incidents are well known to us, but it little is known what the developers are facing challenges to uh, to avoid or to prevent the exposure of secrets um, in software artifacts. So while a developer faces a technical challenge, they query online for us, uh, forums. For example, um, here you can see the developer has posted a question how to keep secrets uh, out of Git repository. And the developer community uh, gives suggestions and solutions to the developers. So by systematically analyzing the questions, we can uh, the, it can reveal the technical challenges um, faced by the developers and also by analyzing the answers uh, provided by the developer community, we can uh, know that what are the practices adopted by the developers um, to uh, prevent the exposure of secrets. So the goal of our paper is to aid researchers and tool developers in understanding and prioritizing opportunities for future research and tool automation for mitigating checked in secrets so an empirical investigation of challenges and solutions related to checked in secrets. We'll answer these research questions, what are the technical challenges faced by developers related to checked in secrets, and what solutions do developers get for mitigating checked in secrets. So we selected three stack exchange sites for question collections, stack overflow, information security, and software engineering. So in total, we extracted 779 questions for our research. So uh, due to the time constraint, I will explain only a few of the highlights of our findings and results. Um, so you can look at um, our paper for more directions or more findings and um, uh, results in our paper. So to answer RQ1, uh, what are the technical challenges faced by the developers? We identified 27 question categories grouped in nine domains. For example, in sectors domain, uh, the categories are store version, ignore hide, exploitability, distribute, and restrictions. And that of VCS feature are history sanitized, ignore already committed, line level security, encrypt file. Uh, the number in the parenthesis denotes the number of questions in that particular category posted by the question, uh, developers. Uh, so I'll explain some of these categories in the ne uh, few, next few slides. So um, in our study, a question lacking an accepted answer or uh, having no answers at all, we term that question a question with unsatisfactory answer. And we found out that um, since 2017, more than 50% of questions in each year have unsatisfactory answers, thus indicating that developers are not getting uh, desired answers for uh, questions related uh, to, their, uh, to checked in secrets. We have also examined the temporal trend to see how um, questions uh, in a particular category changes over time. And uh, we have found that these four question categories, uh, storing or uh, version, secrets, history, sanitizing, features, feature, um, improper configurations during deployment, and storing secrets in client-side applications, these four categories are showing the increasing trend. However, you can see that the more than 45% of, of these questions, uh, the questions of this question category um, are unanswered. So thus substantiating that the developers are not getting well answered uh, re uh, regarding their challenges. So we, we investigated the solutions provided by the de uh, developer community, but my, by, I mean the ex stack exchange users, and we found out that the uh, 13 answer categories uh, such as move secrets out of source code and use template config file, secret management in deployment, and uh, use uh, local environment variables, and so on. And the number in the uh, parenthesis denotes that uh, these question, uh, these answer category has been mentioned in uh, this number, uh, one, uh, this number of um, times in in the questions. So uh, from these slides, I will actually explain uh, a particular challenge and the related uh, answer. And based on our findings, I will uh, also explain what are our recommendations. So in question category Q10, developers are, are facing challenges on rewriting the version control history because they unknowingly or unknowingly they, um, checked in their secrets in the version control system. And the developer community they suggested to use different uh, uh, history rewriting tools, such as git filter branch, git filter repo. However, both of these uh, 
uh, tools have the safety and the usability issues. For example, these tools can easily mix up the old and the new history. Uh, in addition, uh, finding a correct uh, shell script is very difficult. Developers have to try it out on the go and see whether it, it is working or not. There is no preview system. Uh, even worse, the broken filters often result in silent incorrect rewrites without giving any proper output to the developers. Um, even the de if the developer can rewrite the history correctly, there is a way the secret can again come back from the cache from the version control system. Right now, GitHub official documentation, uh, they suggest that, okay, you contact uh, GitHub and provide your repository name, they will clear the cache for you. But which is a manual process right now, since developers are likely to forget these uh, uh, systems should be automated. There are many open source uh, and secret detection uh, tools are present to avoid accidentally uh, committing the secrets. However, previous researchers have found that developers bypass this scan tool warnings because of having high false positive um, uh, alerts. And also it, uh, for the developers, it is very difficult to choose one, uh, one tool out of many. So we recommend that the future researchers and developers uh, work on evaluating the secret detection tools and also improve the tools uh, by reducing their false positives. There are a couple, a couple of additional features we, we saw that the developers are seeking. For example, line level security, where developer wants to mark a specific line and tell the version control system uh, that secure my line so that if, if there is any secret, but it should not be exposed to the uh, public. Uh, but VCS does not support these line level restrictions for now. Um, another um, a feature is the ignore already committed files. So some, the developers know that if you put the secrets, it will be exploited. So knowing that factor, developer wants to commit a default or um, a template file without secrets, and uh, then they want to ignore any changes locally. But uh, how the VCS works, uh, if you commit any file, that file will be tracked by the version control system. So developer wants to uh, ignore the already committed files for, from their tracking, uh, but but it, um, right now, Stack Exchange users suggest using these assume unchanged and skip work tree flags. However, Git official documentation suggests against using these flags. So uh, we recommend that the tool, uh, tool developers uh, or the future researchers work on these type of features. We have seen that um, the developers are facing challenges to avoid secrets in different technologies due to the, app, due to the absence of proper documentation. Here you can see that Foursquare API documentation, they suggest using client secret um, uh, for userless or server-side authentication. However, the developer misinterpreted the documentation and they were asking questions in Stack Exchange that whether this client secret can be used in the client-side authentication or not. Um, but it's not the case. Um, so the, um, Another problem we have found that um, the documentations are not explicitly mentioning whether this particular approach is for development, production, or both environments. So you can see in the uh, left side of the screenshot that this is a continuous deployment for Azure functions, but they, are, they did not mention that this is for development environment. The developer is learning that thing from the Stack Exchange developers answer. So we recommend that the, devel uh, that the, devel um, the technical providers, they uh, mention explicitly the, um, the use cases of their suggested approaches uh, by improving their documentations. We're out of time. Yep. So in summary, we investigated 779 secrets related questions in Stack Exchange. We identified 27 question categories and 13 answer categories. We have proposed um, recommendations for future researchers and tool developers, which uh, some of them I have discussed here. For uh, more of those uh, recommendations and the findings, uh, please look into your paper. Uh, or you can also contact me in this email. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have three minutes for questions. So I guess to get started, I, I, I really enjoy that you have uh, very clear recommendations. But I'm wondering, have you tried to take them forward? Like, for instance, you know, get in touch with the tool developers and say, look, this is our findings. We should actually, you know, uh, implement this feature, do this, uh, document this better, you know, and so on. Yeah, so we have uh, kind of started with the secret detection tools. So we talked about uh, them, that what are the uh, big, why the false positives. So some of those directions we have 
already started talking with them. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's it's great to talk uh, that these are the features that should mm -hmm. develop as well. And also, uh, we as the researchers also will try to you know uh, try to find out a way that how these features can be integrated into the version control systems. Right. Thank you. More questions. One in the back there. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I had a question about, so we had an entire workshop on mining software repositories. And once a secret gets pushed to GitHub, even if you afterwards, if you remove it from the Git history, there's a good chance that it has already been mined by, by a system. And maybe it has also been used to train a machine learning system on. Do you have any recommendation to help with that issue? Yeah, so we we are thinking about uh, actually we have a recommendation something like that. Um, so let's say in, in um, because if it is already committed, there is a chance because there, uh, because there is a uh, one uh, one research have been happened that after one minute in a, in one minute the secrets are being used by the attackers. So the recommendation can be to do it, you know. Um, like uh, uh, preventing the secrets from going into the version control system in the first uh, uh, in the first hand. So uh, there should be a system um, where, like the tools, there, there are a lot of secret direction tools which you can add in the CI/CD platforms or into your commit systems. So those tools right now they provide a lot of false positives. That's why developers are you know uh, not looking at their warnings and al and alert fatigue uh, such phenomena are happening. So the tools needs to be improved so that the accuracy increases. So there is a one way, there, there are a couple of ways uh, to improve such as uh, to uh, have the secrets verification system um, with the API, vend API vendors, or there should be a uh, system where if the particular secret for a uh, particular organization has been found, then there should be a channel of uh, automatic processes that will rewrite the history, revoke the secrets within like, it should be within one minute so that the manual process can be, you know, automatically uh, removed from the system. So that's one thing that can be done. All right, so uh, thank you very much uh, for once again for the presentation. Okay, good afternoon everyone. This is Xin Yuan Miao from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Today I'd like to introduce our work on Java Confidential Computing on, SG, uh, on SGX. Uh, the JACA a lightweight and efficient approach to Java Confidential Computing on SGX. This work is also a joint work with Alibaba Group and Dalian University of Technology. So let's first start with the confidential computing. As companies are deploying their applications on clouds, security concerns usually exist in running these applications on untrusted platforms. According to the state of the data, there are generally several kinds of protection techniques, for example, the file or device encryption for the data at rest, the secure transmission protocols for the data in transit, well, for the data in use, there is a widely studied technique called confidential computing. Confidential computing is a cloud computing technology that performs computation in a hardware-based trusted execution environment, or TE. Many TE solutions have been given so far, such as Intel SGX, um, TransZoom, and AMD SEV. Intel SGX is a representative technique of confidential computing in the server field. In the SGX model, an application is divided into two parts, the trusted part and the untrusted part. The execution of the trusted part is inside a secure environment called the enclave, which is an isolation space where the communication between the inside and the outside world must rely on the secure interfaces provided by the SGX that are the E cores and O cores. In this model, the trusted computing base, or TCB, consists only of the CPU and the enclave, and thus has a relatively small size. Uh, the security, uh, the small, uh, here the TCP can be regarded as the collection of the trusted software, firmware, and hardware. And uh, the small TCP size means the high security. The security advantages of SGX have attracted a lot of research attention. Given that many applications, many cloud applications are written in Java, where Java is vulnerable due to its flexibility, for example, the log 40, 
uh, vulnerability. There is also a significant demand for Java confidential computing on SGX. However, when Java meets SGX, things get a little more complicated. Traditional SGS technique is not job friendly since users can only write enclave functions that are plain C or C++ functions with several limitations. And uh, the execution of Java programs usually relies on a manager runtime, uh, runtime system, the JVM, and thus is not supported directly in the enclave. Prior works propose solutions that uses a library operating system and introduce the feature completed or modified JVM into the enclave. Uh, we call this kind of the solution the JVM in enclave solution, which is a workaround, but on the other hand, also leads to a large TCP side. Having realized the potentials of Java confidential computing on SGX and the limitations of the JVM in Enclave solutions, we proposed the JACON, which means a lightweight and efficient approach to Java confidential computing on SGX. The JACON is expected to meet two goals. First, it should follow the partition model of SGX, which is demand-driven that only the confidential code rather than the whole application should be executed in the enclave. And the second, it should maintain a relatively small TCP size. To achieve this, our approach includes three parts, the secure closed world principle, the service annotation, and the separate compilation. And the introduction of each part will be carried out in the following slides. First, before the code partitioning, we need to determine the form of the, of the confidential code and the code that should be protected. Suppose there are three successively executed methods, M1, M4, and M8, in which there may be calls to confidential methods in enclaves. For example, M1 and M4 call G2 and G5 respectively. Here, G2 and G5 are what we call the starting confidential service, which should be protected. Besides, method invocations may also occur inside these, uh, in, inside these confidential methods. For this cause, we also regard this as the confidential cause, so the execution of them should also be protected. Based on, based on the definition of confidential call, we re refer to the concept of the closed world in the static program analysis and the proposed uh, secure closed world principle. That is, a confidential service, along with all of the classes it depends on and all of the methods it invokes, must be executed in the enclaves. Based on the proposed security principle, we then provide the entry to the closed world by the confidential service annotation. Here we have a piece of code. The method encrypt performs the RSA encryption and needs to be protected. For such a method, it only takes two simple steps to make it a confidential service. First, create an interface annotated with the enclave service annotation and then implement it. The, the, the code of the encrypt method itself is unchanged. The JACON then separately compiles the code. For the untrusted part, the JACON simply compiles the non-confidential code into Java bytecode. Well, for the trusted part, the JACON starts from the entry we have annotated and performs the point to analysis to obtain the code reachability. And then it uses Java static compilation technology to build all the confidential code into native libraries. Moreover, the JACON can automatically generate core entries. So the Java call to the method encrypt from the user's perspective is actually transformed into the JNI call to the confidential method in the native library. The JACON also provides the runtime support for running Java uh, confidential applications. It includes a JVM on the rich execution environment or IE side and a set of execution engines on the TE side. There are also two communication components, the JACON J and the JACON N for the context synchronization between different execution environments. And the figure also demonstrates the process of calling confidential services and more details can be found in our paper. The implementation of the JACON consists of two parts, the toolchain and the runtime spot. For the toolchain, we modify the substrate VM of GraalVM to do the static compilation of confidential code. 
And uh, the Jacon runtime is built atop on Substrate VIM and uh, OpenJDK. In the evaluation, we selected the following techniques for comparison. The Jacon is our approach. Oculum J is a JVM in Enclave technique that utilizes Oculum as the underlying label OS. And BizJ is, uh, uh, is the very common execution mode only for the performance comparison and does not perform any confidential computation. We first evaluate the security of the Jacon and Oculum J with the TCB and the IMF metric. In the TCB metric, the IC and IM represent the Java classes and the methods deployed in the, in the Enclave, respectively, and the, the LS is the size of the secure image built by each technique. The IEM metric is the in Enclave memory footprint when running uh, each benchmark. Our evaluation results demonstrate that Lajacon outperforms Oculum J by a large margin in both TCB and IEM metric. The size of the image built by Lajacon is reduced by an average of over 90% compared with that by Oculum J. Moreover, since Lajacon does not need to launch the JVM to run the program in the Enclave, and the in Enclave memory footprint is also reduced. Next, we evaluate the performance of each technique. We record the overall execution time ET of each benchmark. For the Jacon and Oculum J, we further divide the overall execution time into several parts. The time for in Enclave function execution, context transmission, and environment initialization. In general, benchmarks run slower on Oculum J and the Jacon than on BaseJ. This is because both Oculum J and the Jacon have to initialize an Enclave instance when running the benchmark, and the overhead of which is significant. Uh, moreover, uh, serialization, communication, memory encryption, and decryption also introduce extra runtime overhead. And this figure intuitively compares the overall execution time of the Jacon and Oculum J on each benchmark. The Jacon has a lower time overhead than Oculum J on all benchmarks. However, for some computation intensive benchmarks, as the running time increases, the in Enclave Java code in the Oculum J mode is fully compiled by the JIT compiler. On the other hand, the native code compiled before execution by Lajacon has no chance for optimization at runtime. Therefore, the time gap between Lajacon and Oculum J shrinks. Lajacon is also valuable in practice. The table on the left gives two examples of confidential applications built using Lajacon in the production environment. Also, Lejakon has been incorporated into an open source universal confidential computing framework, Hikle, which is now an Apache incubator project. To summarize our work, we propose a lightweight and efficient approach to Java confidential computing called Lejakon. Lejakon adopts the partition model and uses a demand-driven program paradigm to protect the codes that need to be protected. We propose the secure closed world principle, and guided by this principle, we use Java sta static compilation technology to compile all the confidential code into native libraries, keeping the TCB size small. And we also implement the Lajacon toolchain to build the confidential applications and a runtime system to execute the confidential code. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the paper, our paper, SDK, and the data for evaluation are public. Please scan the QR code for more details. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we have a couple of minutes for, uh, for questions. Uh, anyone? So I wanted to, uh, uh, to ask a bit more to understand. So how much effort is required on the programming uh, side to, uh, to make use of, uh, of your system? Uh, uh, the efforts to implement the system? No, not to implement oh, the system. Okay, okay. You take an application uh, to compartmentalize okay. it Just, uh, uh, to, to, to use <laughs> the it. The effort to build a, a confidential mm. application mm. using our framework. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned in this slide, uh, yeah. So if you have already completed a method uh, in this slide, the encrypt method, and you want to modify it into a confidential application, uh, just two simple steps. 
uh, you should uh, you should create an interface for for for, for it and annotate with the uh, uh, enclave service annotation we provide and then just move the implementation into the right. But how much time did you spend for the benchmarks that you presented? Uh, uh, you, uh, so the question is the details of the benchmark. No, how much time you spent to to adapt the benchmarks to use your framework? Okay, yeah. okay. Just a rough estimate. I mean, you know, was it like a day of work or uh, an hour of work? Uh, uh, if you have noticed uh, the table in the evaluation, you will find the CT benchmark. Uh, I will explain the C what CT ref to. Uh, CT means the core test. Uh, we just collected the uh, test cases of the core module of Bouncy Castle Library. So it's, it's not too much effort, actually. We just do it. All right. Any other quick question? If not, uh, let's thank the speaker once again and move to the last presentation. I'm currently a software engineer at Apple, uh, and I co-authored this paper with Professor Hazley Nascencio and Professor Brent Legacy from University of Washington, Bothell, during my master's program. Um, so before getting into the weeds of our uh, methodology, uh, a little bit of background. So in a software project's life cycle, we know that products go undergo you know, continuous security testing after development and uh, deployment into like pre-production environments. Now, vulnerabilities detected at that stage could lead to you know, uh, multiple code revisions, which can then cause unexpected delays, and then that can cost, uh, cost software companies significant amount of time and money. Now, proactive software maintenance engineering could be one solution whereby you eliminate these security flaws prior to release altogether. But then we need to remember that the reason these vulnerabilities ended up you know, uh, in post-development detection and uh, that they lead to code revisions is because not all software developers have the domain expertise in cybersecurity to, you know, add those mitigative measures um, ahead of time. So with this study, we wanted to enable even those developers who don't have the domain expertise in cybersecurity to add those uh, security mechanisms in a proactive manner. Um, and so we know that uh, companies create uh, technical specification documents or functional specification documents you know, before development. And sometimes even if there are no formal documentations, there are uh, sometimes um, in uh, agile SDLCs, there are user stories, sometimes there are like proof of concept uh, presentations, uh, sometimes there are release manuals or user guides that are created post uh, release. Now, uh, all these documents contain unique keywords that represent functionalities, technologies that are used, architectural decisions, use cases that could potentially be associated with specific vulnerabilities. So we wanted to see if there is significant correlation between those keywords and uh, vulnerabilities that were detected in these systems post-release. Uh, so uh, these are the main contributions uh, of this paper. We created VDOC scan, uh, which is an end-to-end -end vulnerability detection technique, um, and it covers everything from data preparation and data collection to uh, model evaluation. And uh, we also address strategies for you know, addressing class imbalance in the data set, and we are also sharing the extensive data set that we created, mapping product documentation with vulnerability reports. Uh, this is a um, uh, uh, representation of how VDOCSCAN looks in practice. So after the requirement gathering phase, uh, you know, companies create these documentations, whether formal or informal. Um, VDOCs can, can parse those documents uh, and output a list of vulnerabilities that are likely to be identified over the course of the product's life cycle. Now, we know that uh, a lot of known vulnerabilities also have known fixes, uh, like you know, secure design patterns. For example, a vulnerability like you know, uh, improper handling of exceptional conditions could be fixed using a design pattern like safe data buffer. So knowing this list of vulnerabilities that might be detected uh, post-release, uh, now developers can more proactively incorporate the corresponding security mechanisms during the implementation phase. So uh, when we started the study, there was no data set that we could reuse 
for this purpose, so we had to create something from scratch. Um, so we ended up creating two web scrapers, one from, for downloading vulnerability reports for products from the CVE database. Uh, we were able to download about 300,000 vulnerability reports from uh, over 52,000 products by oh, oh, about 24,000 companies. Um, now, the web scraper two, that was to download specification documents of these specific products. Now, that is a little more challenging because they need to be downloaded from the specific companies, uh, like that specific product website, and different companies store documentations in different formats. Sometimes it's PDF, sometimes it's HTML, sometimes it's plain text, and e each of these websites have uh, you know, different endpoints, authentication mechanisms, so it required a lot of manual effort and we ended up with just 3,600 uh, product documentations from about 20 different companies for that preliminary study. Uh, but, and uh, this uh, artifact uh, is available. Uh, we did get the reusability and availability badges, so do check them out. Um, now, for, to make sure that our methodology is like generalizable enough and there are no biases in our findings, we made sure that there is uh, enough variation in the product type. So there were web applications, hardware embedded firmware, operating systems. We also made sure there is a heterogeneity in, the, in, in terms of vulnerability types and also in uh, having more companies so that uh, it accounts for different documentation styles and coding styles. Now, uh, for the keyword extraction itself, uh, we used two of the most popular uh, extraction methods uh, that uh, provide like, you know, the state-of-the-art results in terms of both relevance of the keywords and uh, computational efficiency. Now, uh, so these were TF-IDF, Vectorizer, and Rake. Uh, now, uh, after a manual review, we saw that the degree-to-frequency ratio approach for Rake algorithm uh, retrieve the most relevant keywords from these documentation files. So uh, the keywords extracted look something like this. So RFC 0959, that's like a FTP protocol extracted from a documentation file. Uh, and when we created the data set, there were over like 200 different vulnerability types. Uh, so uh, now for a machine learning model to learn from them, we need enough samples per vulnerability type. So we actually had to kind of condense them and map some of these vulnerability types back to their parent pillars uh, to make sure each type has enough samples for the model to train on. So for example, in that uh, diagram uh, at the top, uh, the CW284 itself has like six subtypes. We, so we ended up relabeling all of them back to the parent pillar uh, 284 to have enough samples. And these were the eight final pillars that we ended up in the data set. Now this is what the final data set looks like. So there is the documentation map to uh, the CWIDs and we did one hot encoding of the IDs. Uh, so if for that product that vulnerability uh, type was reported at some point, it gets a one. Um, yeah, and in our method, we had to do elaborate classifier selection. So we had to do a cross validation to make sure the right model is selected and random forest classifier, which is an ensemble of like decision trees, uh, ended up performing the best. Um, we also had to use F1 score as the scoring mechanism because vulnerability data types are by default imbalanced, like there are a lot more zeros than ones. So if you use something like accuracy, models can get away with just predicting zeros all around. Um, now, um, in our evaluations, we focused on four research questions. We looked at whether uh, you know, white box classifiers that are interpretable and explainable are good enough to do this task. We checked if uh, you know, black box classifiers can improve that performance. Uh, then we looked at whether segregating these products into specific categories like applications, operating systems, or firmwares can help improve it further. Um, and also we did a correlation analysis on that 300,000 vulnerability reports to see if there are co-occurring vulnerabilities that can be simultaneously fixed. Uh, now, in the interest of time, I'll only cover the results of the first two. Uh, now, there were a few interesting observations. Uh, so when we plotted out the decision tree for these vulnerabilities, uh, so here, for example, for uh, 435, the vulnerability description goes something like this. So it's like um, an in 
interaction error happening between two independent entities when they are part of a large system. And you can see FTP server was found to be a very common keyword in the systems that uh, have that vulnerability. Similarly, uh, CWE uh, 682, uh, that vulnerability says like incorrect or unintended uh, like calculation errors happening in a system leading to like security critical decisions or resource management issues. And uh, we see that pthread is a very common keyword in that case, which means that this happens a lot in parallel programming computations uh, due to consistency or concurrency issues. And we also saw significant performance improvement when using black box classifiers, like the random forest classifier, um, and ca uh, segregating into categories like operating systems and embedded firmware further improved the performance. You can see for CW693, we almost uh, got 96% precision and uh, about 91% recall. Uh, but you can see like a significant performance degradation for web applications. This was because uh, after doing the segregation, that category had very few samples for those specific vulnerability types, so the models couldn't really train well. Uh, now, uh, this study wouldn't have been possible without the support of a lot of people who assisted with the data collection and manual validation of the documentation contents and uh, also uh, you know, manual review of the features extracted, and it was f uh, funded by the gra uh, Graduate Division of University of Washington uh, Bottle. And uh, yeah, that's all from me. Here is the link to the full paper. And as I said, the data set and tooling is available. Uh, you're welcome to crowdsource data into it, reuse it. And yeah, feel free to contact if you have more questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> so questions? Hi, I would be interested in how much of the results are actually surprising. So if you have a system that is networked, for example, you have a microservice architecture, let's say, then I would assume that one of the chances that things fail is that people do not properly validate the requests and responses that are exchanged between the services, right? Uh, for that, I would not need any kind of machine learning. This would be the first thing, like if the system has this feature, then there might be a vulnerability in this feature. Do you have any insights on how often you had something as a result that was non-obvious where I say, okay, interesting, I would not have assumed that this is a common vulnerability for this type of system? Uh, so in, uh, like, we were able to do a lot of this like interpretable analysis on the decision tree specifically, not on the subsequent analysis. So in the decision tree, uh, we did see like some cases where if they used a specific technology like SCADA, like that was associated with, uh, for example, authentication related vulnerability. So uh, it, I think, helps when uh, in a system you're supposed to reuse a particular technology or a library. Uh, you know, that might highlight a particular vulnerability that might come uh, with it. And uh, again, going back to the initial motivation that we want to enable developers who don't have the domain expertise in cybersecurity, it might not be obvious to them that even if it's a microservice or a web service that, oh, this is susceptible to this type of like network uh, issue. So uh, having this might give them an insight like, okay, uh, it's kind of giving in to them like in a silver platter that you're supposed to fix this. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Yep, thank you. We have another question here. Um, just wait. Okay, so... All right, so we have another one over there then. <laughs> Thank you very much for the good presentation. Uh, I have a quick question about methodology. So when you map the, um, the identified vulnerability um, keywords from the document back to CWE structure, it kind of like a known problem in CWE that like some of the CWE item in like in a very, very deep note um, are kind of overlapping in multiple categories. So when you, when you map that back, how did you manage that kind of problem? Yeah, so uh, if we go back to the data set, uh, these were each of the CWID was a, a, like separate binary classification. So even if a particular vulnerability belongs to multiple categories, it will just receive a one in both category, and we do binary classification separately. So there are the chances that like um, some some of the vulnerability might be classified in 
Okay, so it will be classified in just one class, right? Is that right? So, uh, in the sense like, so in any software product, it's not like it has only one vulnerability. It can have multiple vulnerabilities. So we predict like all the vulnerabilities that it is likely to have. Okay, I see. Thank you. Uh, all right, if it's a quick question, uh, please. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, the presentation. Just a quick question. Uh, when you talk about the upper parameter tuning, uh, you talk about class imbalance, uh, uh, weighting uh, the class. Uh, did you thought to use uh, actually uh, something like, uh, for example, auto wag and so on, uh, and let it run for some days, two, three, one week, etc., to get something automatically suggested, uh, or uh, even, uh, oh, did you try it? So, yeah, yeah, we used a grid search, like with a lot of variety of like these different hyperparameter uh, like values, and we did let it run over like a couple of days to get like the right uh, parameters for each of the models we were comparing, um, and uh, also when we were comparing the like models against each other. Yeah. Systematically in one yeah. All right. Let's thank the speaker once again. And uh, thanks to all the speakers of this session. Uh, this brings also.